Happy Tools Explained. Um, we can see people just, just filling in, so we're gonna wait for about one more minute before we uh, officially start off. Um, so while we wait, I'll just welcome you and thank you for joining this, uh, this afternoon session, at least here in, in sunny Norway. And just like previously, if you have any questions, if you have any comments, if you have any, uh, anything you'd like to add, please use the, uh, the webinar chat uh, box. And myself and Jolene will be responding on the fly. All right, so welcome everyone to our fourth webinar. Uh, if this is the first time you're joining, welcome. If you're a return uh, visitor, a re return guest, welcome back. I'm, I'm glad to have you, uh, have you with us. Let me just uh, check the technology here. If you guys can just uh, uh, give me a, a thumbs up or an okay. Do you hear me and do you see me okay? You see the slides okay? All right, we have a few raised hands here. Excellent. Good, good. Thank you. Excellent. So today's, today's topic is strategy tools explained. Uh, if you have been following some of our most, uh, most recent webinars, this is going to be a little bit different. Um, maybe um, more storytelling, maybe a little bit more personal. Um, I'm going to try to make it not very academic. Uh, we're not going to go into much of the research. I'll, I'll mention it. Uh, and we're not going to go into sort of the, the deep, deep uh, concepts and tools. Uh, we'll keep it quite high level. But I do want to make sure that towards the end, we're going to try to make it very relevant. Easy to understand and relevant for, for you guys. So uh, you'll, see, uh, you'll see when we get towards the, the end, uh, I'm really going to repeat a few things and try to make it relevant for you guys. All right, so I want to I want to start with a, um, a story that took place here in um, Spain. I can't <laughs> I can't really remember where in Spain it was one 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 of the Spanish islands. Uh, we had a client seminar and, and there was a client strategy uh, seminar and like most client seminars it looked like this we had about 300 people sitting down in a big room um, overall intrigued and enthusiastic um, but as many of you probably know having 300 people sit down in the room for a strategy session isn't really the best way of getting things done. <clears throat> this is more what we like. This is a big part of why we believe in strategy tools. Starting the breakout, starting the conversation, starting the engagement, but getting people on their feet, getting people from a large 300 people to small cross-interaction, inter, uh, cross-discipline groups, where you have people from marketing, product development, R&D, sales, uh, sales regions coming together. You get engagement, you get buy-in. Start working on different tools, answering different strategic questions. In this case, discussing what should our innovation portfolio look like over the next five to 10 years with people from various parts of the company. But you do this with a timer. So you work quick cycles iteratively in mixed groups. And I know some of you have a good experience in, in facilitation, but with or without the timer makes all the difference in the world. Get people on the wall, get people to write, to sketch, to draw, to illustrate, and get people to focus. 
What would you see in this picture? And of course, there's a lot of stuff from this client session that I can't share. What would you see in this picture is the CEO, Torben, he's sitting in the middle, great guy. He really grasped how to work differently on, on strategy. You see a few of his uh, management team, uh, and you see a few people from different sections of the company. Uh, this is in the final sprint. We're pulling things together and getting 300 people across the company to contribute on strategy and new business development in a very intense setup, a very intense period of time. Closing out this story, closing out this strategy session for a large global client on a Spanish island, these were some of the feedback people came up with. Fun, best, energizing, inspiring, inspirational, fantastico, um, created ownership for innovative thinking, inspiring, high energy, fantastic, innovative, wonderful, improved my thought process. These are words you, in many cases, not normally associate with the strategy process and the business development process. Uh, we believe tapping into creativity, innovation, new ideas can unlock uh, a whole dimension of new growth opportunities for companies uh, to create better understanding, better buy-in, and simply better strategies for the future. So why do we need new strategy tools? This is a question that we have been working on for about eight years now. Uh, we didn't think we have all the answers. We have some, hopefully. Uh, we feel that we're probably about maybe 50% of, of the way to where we would like to be, maybe a little bit less. But it's a question that's been driving us. It's been driving our research. It's been driving our thinking, our, our thought processes, our quests for the last almost eight years. And to summarize that question, why do we need new strategy tools? We have three answers. Number one, for most companies today, whether you're a high-tech company, a fast-moving consumer good, a mobility company, airline, oil and gas energy company, the strategic context you're in and the era you're in is very different from the period, the time period when most strategy tools originally were made. Uh, you look at the classic traditional tools, uh, SWOT, PESL, uh, BCG matrix. These were, these were developed 1969, 1974, 1975, 1984, 1985. Uh, today is a very different era. Things move much faster. It's a very different uh, competitive environment. Uh, much more technology, much more globalization. So it's a different era that requires new strategy tools regardless of industry. So that's, that's the high level. Why do we need new strategy tools? The second is we firmly, deeply believe that we need new strategy tools to create a shared understanding across different levels of the company. This can be at the board level, at the management level, at the officer level, or down across different organizational levels. But working differently on different strategy tools, help create a shared understanding of the strategy and the roadmap and so on. And finally, and this is maybe the most important, new strategy tools help drive better strategy execution. Co-creating, co-designing, and being a part of the process means that you also have a much bigger stake in the execution. So that's kind of a brief introduction a brief story from the Spanish islands into strategy tools explained. So welcome everyone. Um, if we haven't met before, my name is uh, Chris uh, Kirsten Lagen in uh, full local language and I'll be hosting you. Uh, I'm together with uh, Jolene uh, in the background that you can't see. And a lot of the stuff that we're going to show you today is free for you guys to download. Uh, 
all of our work goes online uh, under the Creative Commons uh, model. If you share it, use it and share it. If you develop new stuff on top of it, you're very welcome to. Uh, just give credits and keep sharing it. Uh, because in an academic discipline, I think it's important for us to share, challenge and expand our work. But also we want our free tools to have more impact. So most of the stuff that we'll all be showing today, you can go online and download. You'll find um, all in all about 18 tools now. We have several handbooks or guidebooks, how-to books, and we keep putting on more stuff, testing more stuff, and trying out new uh, tools regularly. So all the free stuff you can find online. You're also very welcome to join the conversation. You can chat, you can ask questions. Uh, if you don't have any questions, you can just wave, just for the fun of it. Um, we will also, just towards the end, do a full Q&A. So if any of you have kind of very lengthy questions, we will take our time to answer them in full towards the end. But please, as we proceed, just fire away any questions. So very briefly, my background, in case we haven't met before. So I'm Chris. My day job is uh, really consulting and advisory around strategy and uh, transformation. I'm also business school faculty and I'm a researcher and idealist in designing new strategy tools. Our, our strategy and innovation consulting business gets to take these tools into a real life setting. And we've, we worked with companies more or less around the world from Sri Lanka to Norway, from Brazil to Estonia, in, in implementing these tools in different settings, in different types of organizations. Uh, and I really hope that some of our work is easy to grasp uh, for you, so you can apply them within your own organization. Now, we, uh, we generally partner with CEOs, strategy and transformation, uh, innovation and new ventures. You can also apply these tools to uh, other business units, even down to your own local team, uh, almost regardless of, of industry. We have applied these tools, again, in different settings, uh, to solar uh, industry, mobility, drones, fish farming. So our tools are really industry um, agnostic. You can apply them to virtually any industry. Uh, we do keep getting questions about how do these adapt to public services, and I'll, I'll get back uh, to that a little bit later today. We have a hashtag if you wanna if you wanna try it out and join the conversation. It's simply strategy tools. All right, so let's get into that the meat, uh, the main content of today, and I'm gonna take you on a little trip to a Norwegian village, way up in the mountains called Voss. Uh, Voss is a place few people live, but many go skiing. Uh, if you go there during the summertime, chances are you're going to hike in the mountains, kayak in the rivers, or jump out of planes due to the uh, uh, local parachute club. But it's also a place that for many years had a company called NST, uh, Nordic Speech Technologies. I used to work there uh, way back in 1999, my first real job. And while I was there, myself and several of my colleagues read a book, I trust most of you are familiar with it by now, called The Innovator's Dilemma. And what Clayton Christensen famously wrote in The Innovator's Dilemma is really the challenges of innovation in large firms. Uh, his uh, disruptive innovation framework developed on the premises that as innovation happens, big companies tend to be outcompeted by their own stupidity. Uh, by following a very rational, traditional mindset to strategy, they keep going up market, they keep going up price, and eventually they get uh, outcompeted from the bottom up. And this was, this was a, um, a powerful learning experience that stuck with me and also many of my, uh, my colleagues at the time of what does this mean for innovation and strategy in larger firms? Now, at the time, we didn't have any answers, but it was questions that really stuck 
all, all the way back to, since 1999. A couple of years later, I was running a consulting project in the beautiful west coast town of Bergen, Norway. Some of you might have been there, some of you might have been there as a tourist. If not, you should go. Make sure to go during the summertime, it rains a lot. But I was running a strategy program and what we couldn't figure, figure out was why, why was the, the strategy process of this company so dull? There was no energy, there was no enthusiasm, there was no creativity. Uh, it was, I mean, you can almost call it a dead beat kind of activity. Uh, top management tried to have a, a strategy process for a fairly ambitious company, but they just couldn't generate any enthusiasm, any excitement. Um, we were really struggling trying to crack how do we get more of the brain power, of the creativity, of the insight, of the disruptive potential of the employees within this company. And again, back in 2004, we didn't really have any tools that helped us. We were looking around for tools, like how do we find tools that allows us to work very differently with strategy? One of the tools that we uh, started playing with uh, at the time is called Verna Alley Value Network. It looks like this. Some of you might be familiar with it. If not, I recommend you look it up. Uh, and the value network analysis is really an interesting strategy tool for mapping out the external environment and how your company kind of interacts at many levels with it. It's a group-based tool. You can use it as a software, but it's much better as, as a group. And it requires many perspectives. It, it's not possible to do this fully with top management alone. Uh, so we applied this to, to the Bergen case and also a few other companies. We said, hmm, this is interesting. Once we give them these kind of tools, they work differently. We, we release some sort of creative energy. Um, we get a very different outcome in terms of the strategic outcome of the firm. Uh, so by changing the tool, good stuff happened. But still, we didn't really have a toolkit. We didn't really have what we at the time needed. But the experience stuck, stuck with me. A couple of years later, I uh, found myself in Copenhagen, Denmark. Beautiful, beautiful city. And uh, at the time I was doing my, my MBA and two books that was uh, very uh, interesting was uh, Cosmos Marquitas, Game Changing Strategies, and also of course, Gary Hamill, The Future of Management. Now, what both of these books talk about is disruptive strategies, game changing strategies, radical innovation, uh, transformational thinking, you know, big words, but regretfully also mostly words. Good cases, good stories, good examples, but didn't really give you a, so how do we do it? Didn't give you how to. Uh, like most literature at the time, it was mainly just that, literature. A lot of text, very heavy to grasp, very rich in content, but it told you more about research than how to. And at the time I was very curious to try to understand why a lot of these kind of disruptive strategy thinkers were putting so much text. When you know that the attention span of most management is well not very long and, and also not very um, well they simply don't have time for this right so how can we take the big ideas because these books I mean they have, they have really good ideas they have really important ideas I think what, what Gary Hamill wrote in the future of management is incredibly important but it's not always easily accessible so how do we take this fantastic thinking and make it more accessible? How do we translate books to tools? That became a question that we started digging into. We need to find better ways of finding better tools. And that, you might want to say, became our mission for the years to come. We have learned 
the hard way and, and, and the good way to make simple visual tools that are easy to grasp, easy to present, easy to communicate, but maybe quite complex in nature. They have depth, yet simplicity. Um, some of the tools that we're developing, and we're going to show you in a few minutes, uh, I've really found spot on. Uh, we know exactly how to use them, where to use them, and what kind of impact we can expect. And some of the tools we're continuously thinking, testing, adapting, and changing. Some are really good. Some are still work in progress. What we realized, though, this is back in 2010, 2011, was that we were not alone. We were definitely not alone. There was, at the time, a global movement of people, of uh, organizations, of researchers, um, ambassadors, that were really asking some of these same questions. Some of, of the people that we connected with and have been either speaking a lot with or, or, or working closely with has been um, Professor Rita McGrath at Columbia uh, Business School in New York City. She has, some of you probably know this, been rated repeatedly as, as one of the most influential strategy and business thinkers. Uh, she's been really influential in shaping our thinking and also helping trying to translate heavy text to easy to grasp tools. Uh, you might want to check out her latest project. It's called the Valise, uh, Valise.com, uh, where she's developing her new tool software. Uh, also, InnoSight, a uh, consulting company based out of Boston and Singapore, they've been doing a lot of work in, in trying to simplify and clarify the message to senior executives. And then, of course, the, the great people and the, the team at Strategizer have uh, been doing wildly impressive work with the Business Model Canvas, uh, Business Model Generation book. Uh, great book, uh, value proposition design and the work they've done around that. Um, but there's, there's many uh, ideas, people working on simple visual strategy tools. One of the most influential to our work has been this guy, uh, Holger, Holger Niels Paul. So Holger is a fabulous, fantastic German. He was supposed to join us today, but he just couldn't make it. Um, so he's been working with us in Norway, in Germany, in Asia um, to help management teams even better understand how to simplify a strategy, how to visualize strategy, and how to use visual strategy tools for better business impact. So if you get a chance to meet Holger, I really recommend that you, um, that you do. So that's... That's kind of a little bit about our, our background. Now, we've been developing this since uh, 2011. And, and what, what I'm gonna show you here is a picture of my living room wall back home in my apartment uh, in 2011. So what you see here, we were working on one of our book drafts, uh, and this is the very first tool design that we called, still calls, the Innovation Pyramid. Uh, the Innovation Pyramid is a tool that I'm going to get into a little bit later in, in more detail. Uh, but it was really our, um, our genuine first MVP, a minimum viable product, that we tested in, in how can we create better, simpler uh, tools. Our very first website on an Instagram picture looked like this. At the time, we called it strategy tools for the next generation. Uh, I can't even remember how long it took us to make the website. It probably wasn't very long. Uh, but it's a perfect example of what we would call a hack. Let's set it up, put it out there, make it open, make it free, have people download, have people contact us, and we'll see what happens. We'll take it from there. Uh, we've also uh, been using uh, guinea pigs and... Uh, uh, test users. Uh, we have the CEO for a test user. We have management team for test users. We have innovators and innovation teams. And, and we also include you know, our own kids as test users. Uh, and a lot of our development has really been happening while traveling, on vacation, weekends. And it's been a fabulous journey so far. 
as we've been progressing this, we have been running many different types of tools, many different types of settings. And, and the first time that we really presented this in a large conference was back in uh, 2012 in Copenhagen, where we hosted a workshop um, for uh, front end of innovation with about 40 participants, 50 participants from different organizations giving us incredibly important feedback. And it's this feedback loop that's been driving our development. Here uh, we are in Italy working with um, Record Ben Kieser, the uh, fast moving mushroom good company, where we hosted, well, we've been hosting several innovation workshops on strategic innovation to help them come up with new ideas, better strategy understanding, and overall more impact on their business. Strategy tools can be used in large group settings. And what you see here is, is me presenting to probably a group of 60 to 80 people uh, where I'm using a combination of the two meter by one and a half meter tool printout with uh, studies. And this is, you might want to see, a, say, a lecture or teaching setup. But it, it can also be used very much for an individual breakout. So this picture is in the same room as the previous. So I would typically present on a large scale. And then people would join uh, working individually on their own business cases. Strategy tools can be printed and prepared in many different ways. Here we have a gentleman, uh, Pete Brody from uh, BAE, a British uh, military manufacturer, presenting three levels of business models out of that workshop in, um, in Munich. We can also use the tools extensively with breakout groups, where groups from different parts of the same company or the regular teams go out, work on their own challenges and bring it back and then sometimes our strategy tools are best fitted for individual use. Just myself working on my own company challenges. Uh, numerous top management uh, that I uh, work with prefer to work with the strategy tools by themselves alone for reflection, thinking, planning, um, sorting out their ideas, so to speak. But I really believe that the large impact lies in large groups. We have run uh, groups up to 350, 400 people. We can probably facilitate between five and 600 people as long as the room is, is large enough uh, to get people off their chairs and into a really creative, engaging, powerful uh, working environment. High level of energy, high level of buy-in, high level of discussions, and high level of execution. We're still developing. We have been developing this since, since 2011. Uh, we've learned a lot. And we kind of gotten to this stage where we can say a few things. Number one, strategy tools is, is probably the modern strategist toolkit. Strategists can be a chairman of the board, CEO, chief strategy officer, uh, strategy and business development team. It can be a formal position, it can be an informal position. But having seen hundreds of organizations take our tools, learn our tools, go through the training, go through the certification, go through the training trainers process, these tools, they work. And we're very happy to share them for free uh, on strategy tools. So that's, that's the high level. I'm now going to go into five tools in particular. Before I do that, I just want to ask, pause for a second and see, now is a good time if you have any questions. Uh, you're very happy to put in any kind of question you have in our chat box. Uh, feel, feel also free uh, to add any kind of comments, reflection, observation. Feel free to add your own experiences. Um, and we'll try to use this webinar and this chat box for 
back and forth communication before we proceed to the next one. Next, sorry, next section. So I have a comment here from Joseph. That's very kind of you, uh, Joseph. Um, so I can, I can mention the certification just very briefly. So we, we, care, we care about people being successful using our tools. Uh, we're happy to share them for free. And, and if you're an experienced facilitator, you can probably just download and put them to work yourself. Um, so what we do is we run a three-day and also a five-day trained trainer uh, program. The three-day program is called Strategy Tools Master Trainer. Uh, and within those three days, you really learn the basics of how the tools work, how you can apply them, and we give you some pretty, pretty intense um, hands-on guiding, hands-on training in how to use them in different settings as a one-to-one -one, uh, coaching uh, tool individually, uh, as a group, maybe as a classroom teaching, but also on a large scale facilitation. The five-day program is really for advanced level facilitation. So there's some strong overlaps, but it's a little bit different. Uh, if you're interested, uh, Joseph or anybody else, uh, just let us know and we can pick up a conversation on, on more of that uh, afterwards. All right, so let me, let me get into the five tools that we picked for today. Uh, I'm gonna give you the high level introductions. I'm gonna give you some pointers all of these tools have more information available. Due to the time of a one hour webinar, we're not gonna go into the heavy depth, if you will, or the deep examples, if you will. Uh, but we'd be very happy to share more of this content and um, you'll find a lot of this uh, online as well. So if you have any questions that doesn't get fully answered during this webinar, you let us know and we'll make sure to give you the information that you lack. All right. We also have how-to guides. Uh, this is something we're experimenting with and, and uh, trying out. We currently publish, I think it's two or three. We have two or three more coming. And all five of these tools will have their own how-to guides coming up uh, shortly. All right, so the first, the first tool that we're gonna talk about is the two lenses on strategy. Uh, the two lenses of strategy is, um, you could say it's not really a tool in its most traditional sense, but I, I use it as a tool because I see the impact it has. The two lenses of strategy is really a tool to help the audience understand strategy at a fairly fundamental level, fairly fundamental level. Um, also, it's really about helping the audience understand how strategy can be different from what they were taught in school, right? Most managers, most executives today, they, they learned what we call traditional strategy. They did not learn how we would view strategy today. The tool, some of you might have seen it, is a fairly simple setup based on two premises. Number one, you have strategy as analysis which is on the left side of, of the screen, viewed my way. Strategy as analysis is the traditional view and traditional method of working with strategy. If you look in the middle, in the center, uh, you can see a few um, uh, areas with, with uh, red uh, color. So on the first, strategy as analysis is a very analytical, is a very logical, very linear thinking. It's a traditional strategy mindset, you, you might say. On the other side, we have strategy as innovation. Now, strategy as innovation is a very different approach. It's a very different mindset to strategy. Strategy as innovation views strategy as a fundamentally creative, fundamentally disruptive exercise. So you have these uh, two very different schools of thought. Some of you might be familiar with um, uh, Strategy Safari by Minsberg, Henry Minsberg, where he speaks of the elephant and the 10 different schools of 
strategy. Well, we, we build our, our work on the same understanding that there are really two very different schools, not 10, but two very different schools, strategy as analysis and strategy as, in, as, in, as innovation. Strategy as analysis builds on traditional analytical and linear thinking. Ambitions for the future, it's quite logical. People's unknown or, or hidden expectation is that, well, the future is going to be pretty much like today or like yesterday. Um, the future is going to be stable. Uh, people are rational and they behave rationally and you can analyze them rationally and you can expect rational behavior at any uh, level. And as top management, our most important job is to preserve, maybe tune, tweak our existing business model. We have one business model, we should defend it at all costs. We erect moats, barrier to entry, and we use very traditional tools. We use the SWOT because it works. We use the PESTO. We use the value chain and the five forces. Um, on implementation of strategy and change, we know it's difficult, but we suffer through it. The leading proponent of this school, this strategy as analysis, is Michael Porter. Michael Porter is a widely recognized uh, academic researcher, speaker on strategy, um, but his view of the world is really anchored in a traditional logic framework. Now, the other school, that's, that's where the fun happens, right? Strategy as innovation is a very, very different mindset. Fundamentally creative, fundamentally disruptive. This is Roger Martin. This is Clayton Christensen. This is Gary Hamill. This is Rita McGrath. Uh, this is very offensive, ambitious, uh, forward-leaning corporate mindset. Uh, it's a fundamental assumption, and this is important. It's a fundamental assumption that the future is going to be different. The future is going to be unstable. The future is, or well, we don't know, but we know it's going to change. We just don't know exactly how or how soon. Uh, people perspective is very often a, a much more energetic, much more passion. And the business model thinking is radically different. In strategy as innovation, we continuously develop and test a portfolio of new business models, meaning many different business models running in parallel at the same time, right? So the tools that we use would be Clayton's disruptive innovation framework. It would probably be the business model canvas. Uh, quite likely, it would be a business model portfolio tool, like the three levels of business models. Um, we find that companies successfully use the strategic innovation canvas. It's coming in a second. And of course, they would use the innovation pyramid for ID generating um, new business opportunities. In strategies as innovation, change is really fun. It's, it's challenging, it's tough, yeah. But making change happen is a good thing. It's not a difficult, hard thing. Uh, one of the leading proponents of this would be Gary Hamill. I mentioned his book earlier. Uh, Rita McGrath, Columbia, I mentioned her earlier. Uh, and when you put those two schools of thought, they become quite uh, crystallized, polarized. Now, what never ceases to fascinate me is whenever I give a presentation, this table, this, uh, this tool is where most people stop to take photos. Uh, so it can be a very senior business management, it can be a large conference, but when I get to this slide, this is where the smartphones come up and pictures are taken. I believe it's really important for companies to have a clear understanding of these two schools. Uh, you can choose, you can make a conscious choice as a company to say, no, we're gonna go with strategy as analysis or we're gonna go with strategy as innovation. But what I see is that most companies are simply just blind to these two different schools. So that's, that's the first one I wanted to touch on today. Two lenses on, on strategy. The next one, I'm gonna just touch on that very briefly, is called the Market Opportunity Canvas. This is a tool that we've developed fairly recently. Um, it's really a tool built to help you spot market opportunities. And I think we can spot market opportunities 
from many different angles or many different sources. So one of the things that we have observed, observed and you might have seen the, the same thing, is that a lot of organizations, they tend to generate ideas successfully or unsuccessfully internally. That's the bottom left, our ideas. But of course, that's, that's not the only one, right? Market opportunities can emerge from technology. Emerging technologies will trigger and enable new market opportunities. They might not uh, make sense at first, but they can. Trends, mega trends, local trends, uh, quick living fashion trends, they will create market opportunities if you stay attuned. And of course, customer needs more in the uh, design thinking lean startup uh, philosophy. Customer needs today's known and unknown. Using this tool, we have uh, seen some pretty cool examples of organizations understanding market opportunities very differently from only our own ideas. It might require some uh, get out of the building visits. It might require go out and speak with people. It might require you to read McKinsey's disruptive technology uh, report. But the market opportunity canvas is one example of, well, how can we find new business ideas at a high level? And then we gotta break them down into uh, market size, early validation, business model designs, pivots, and, and so on. But at a very high level, very conceptual level, the market opportunity canvas is an interesting and a good tool for finding new business opportunities. Uh, it really came out of the book by, uh, by Rowan Gibson. Uh, he was very influential in, in, in our thinking around this. So um, uh, Rowan Gibson's Four Lenses of Innovation was kind of a key source in our developing of the market opportunities canvas. Now the next tool, and this is the oldest tool that we have in our, in our toolkit, is the Innovation Pyramid. The Innovation Pyramid is really an ID generation. Tool. It is built with a specific purpose of helping large and diverse groups coming up with new ideas. The innovation pyramid is built on two design principles. Number one, there are nine levels of innovation. And number two, there's a continuum from incremental to radical innovation. So once you understand the nine levels and the continuum, you have basically a simple framework for understanding that, wow, there's a lot of um, angles that we can take to start our, our innovation journey. Some companies naturally have strengths in, in some areas. Some companies have other strengths in other areas. What we have seen is that within 15 to 20 minute introduction and then about an hour of work, companies are amazed, groups and teams are amazed of how many new ideas they're able to come up with where they previously had none. So let me, let me quickly take you, take you through the nine levels. So level number one, you can see this on the tool if, if you have a screen uh, good enough or, or size enough. The first level is the design and marketing. So this would be what the product looks like, what the marketing mix uh, is, and how you think about your, um, your visual and communication mix. And of course, there's a lot of different innovation you can do within the design and marketing. Second is product development and product innovation. Now, should we have pink Coca-Cola or should we have black Coca-Cola? That would typically be product innovation, service innovation. Should we move from product sales, music CDs, to streaming, which would be a pay per month service with Spotify. Level number four, markets, customers, and channels. Which markets, geographies do we serve? Which customer segments do we serve? Can we find new ways of looking at customer segments? And how do we reach them through which channels? Technology, 
technology innovation, process innovation. And when we get down to uh, level number seven, so I said the nine levels of innovation, when we get to level number seven, we get into, into an uh, interesting area that came out of Gary Hamill's work called management innovation. So management innovation is organizing how we work, the leadership function, the people uh, and the uh, process function, talent management, time management function. And I believe that there's a lot of innovation to be had within management innovation. We get down to level number eight. It takes us into business model innovation. Uh, business model innovation is, for many, challenging, complex, uh, poorly understood, although it's getting better. And then we get to level number nine, industry level innovation. Industry level uh, innovation is really fundamental, structural, big changes to how an industry operates and some of the strategic assumptions that this industry has. So those nine levels give you a framework. Now we, we've listed those nine out of what we see in our work uncovered in terms of simplicity versus complexity. It's not necessarily easy, but it's generally easier to work on design, marketing, and product innovation. And then it gets more difficult when you get into the process innovation, the management innovation. But by far, for most companies, the most challenging aspects is to work on fundamental business model or industry level innovation. This is what it looks like in use, in this case, in Italy. So this is a very diverse group from the same uh, company that's exploring new ideas. And as you can see, they have uh, some study notes, stickies, on design, on product, on services, and also on, on business model and industry. Now, this picture is quite representative that most teams come up with not only design and marketing, not only products, but really a mix across the uh, innovation pyramid. So we've run probably hundreds of teams through this and it works extremely well for helping diverse groups come up with different ideas. So go back to uh, Joseph, who's uh, teaching creativity and innovation. Um, a couple of years ago, I wrote a case study on Skype, sorry, sorry, uh, on Spotify. And I gave the students the case study on Spotify. Half the students got to use their textbook strategy to come up with a new growth strategy for Spotify. And the other half was given the innovation pyramid and requested to use the innovation pyramid as a tool for developing a new strategy for Spotify. And as you might want to guess, the, uh, the results were kind of mind-blowing. Every single group that used a traditional strategy book, the traditional strategy tools on Spotify came up with more of the same. They should defend their position. They should uh, make sure to to, uh, to charge through a premium or a subscription model, and they should uh, do more of the same. Nothing wrong with that, but very linear. Every single student group that used the innovation pyramid came up with wildly creative ideas, very uh, interesting growth portfolios, and uh, they were really, really able to understand how to expand your thinking, how to expand your ID generation in terms of marketing, in terms of new products, in terms of adding new services, in terms of developing new content, applying new technologies, coming up with new business models, and also how to disrupt other industries. So I've seen this tool work really well in, in teaching settings. Uh, <laughs> there you go. Uh, in uh, large groups and also in, in small groups. Uh, if it makes any sense, I'd be happy to share the Spotify case, although it's outdated now. But I think that as teachers, uh, we can use these tools to teach and also to test and experiment in the classroom. So if this makes sense, uh, Joseph, go for it and let me know how it works. 
So taking you into the next tool, which probably is my favorite, uh, my personal favorite is the strategic innovation canvas. The strategic innovation canvas has a different purpose. That's important to notice. Uh, this is not so much about creativity and coming up with new ideas, but it's about building a strategic minded innovation portfolio. Now that means that you can mix and combine those two, the innovation pyramid that we just looked at, that you, you, you can use the innovation pyramid for generating 500 ideas. And then you bring that over into the canvas to select the few you want to take from. So the strategic innovation canvas is built on the principles of the three horizons or McKinsey's three horizon. This is to most of you probably a very uh, well-known uh, framework. It's easily accessible in the textbooks, uh, but our passion lies in taking stuff out of the textbooks, building simple, easy to use tools that people can, can put to use, right? So what you see here is you have a time continuum on the x-axis, and we generally recommend five, 10 year strategy perspective. And then you have a degree of uh, uh, fresh thinking, creativity, innovation, and the ability to execute on change as your uh, Y uh, axis. And within that framework, you have operation. Should we, should we focus our innovation on improving the existing business model? That's defending what you already do. Should we grow our um, innovation portfolio to improve uh, path extensions and improve logical areas like expanding our product mix, adding new services, uh, or, or trying out a, a new business model? Or should we really have, have, have the focus and the courage to look at various radical innovation and really explore possibilities that lie beyond the obvious? So there's no, there's no right or wrong here. But we always recommend get a mix, get a portfolio, do some of each, and then it's totally up to you how you should balance that. There's a wonderful HBR article that came out a couple of years ago called Managing Your Innovation Portfolio that basically talks about this tool and this thinking. And what this article says is that if you're in a slow moving industry, like cement, maybe 75 to 95 percent of your innovations should go into operation if you're in a very fast moving industry like like technology software development probably 50 or more percent of your innovation should go into radical to really be ahead of the curve and develop stuff that's groundbreaking rather than sustaining so this is what it looks like in one example. This is a client we work with in, uh, in the energy field where they realized that all of their thinking, all of their uh, innovation work was really traditionally focused on maintaining ongoing operation. So in this example, they developed an innovation portfolio where they, for the first time, um, really were able to agree on how and why we should have a portfolio of some innovations around our current business model, some innovation that are basically extending what we do, and then a handful of projects or a handful of uh, moonshots that would allow us to explore fairly radical innovation by our cultural standards. So there are many ways of building an innovation portfolio. And if you go on our website, if you, if you search around a little bit, you'll find several case studies where we mentioned this. Uh, but we, we have seen some really good results where companies are able to develop in-house innovation portfolio by tapping into a lot of people internally. All right, so I, I said I was gonna go through fairly quickly and I'm gonna keep that up. So the, le the, the last tool that we're gonna show right now is what we call the strategy intro. Very simple name, strategy intro. And it really is a strategy entry level tool, entry level. Uh, so Joseph, this is probably what I would make sure that my students understood at, at, a, at a basic level. And 
we've strived to make it simple. Number one, map out your ambitions. You can call it vision, mission, strategic intent, uh, position statement. Uh, we prefer, <clears throat> prefer the word ambitions. And then you have map out your core business, your growth areas, and your explore. Define up to maximum three KPIs per each of these areas, and that is your strategy intro. Now, if you remember the two lenses of strategy, you know that the main thinking was defend and preserve your existing business model at all costs. Here in the strategy intro, we say, no, no, no. Uh, at all costs, we need to keep developing new business models while we're also running the existing. So the first area here is, well, what's our legacy core business? We have a business model for it. Here you see the uh, business model canvas. Um, we fix it, we tune it. Our uh, KPIs are mostly on efficiency, uh, ROI, and revenue, and profit margin. Fairly traditional business metrics. Now the growth businesses, which is the, you know, the second box over, that's really where we grow new stuff within reason. We can add new products, we can add new markets, but nothing too crazy, right? KPIs would be efficiency or, or revenue growth. Um, we want to see growth, but we want to be very careful. Now, what, would, what we find that most companies struggle with is, is this explore idea. We suggest in this area, develop a portfolio of many new business models, some small, some medium, some big, some um, riskier than others. You might want to call it moonshots. That's what Google calls them. Disruptive business models, radical innovation. But the interesting thing here is the KPIs are very different. It makes no sense, right, to uh, look at what's our current ROI on these. It's way too early to tell. And it makes no sense to look at what's our profit margin. It's way too early to tell. But the metrics that we recommend here, the KPIs we recommend, okay, how many experiments, experiments have we run? How many accelerators have we been involved with? And how many business models have we killed, right? So you have these, these three. And within the strategy intro, you basically fit those in one very, very simple framework. Now, I'm, I'm fascinated by how amazed a lot of management teams are when we're able to strip it down to this level of simplicity. We, um, we really, really see a good understanding once senior management teams are able to map their own company into this. And like, like most, not all, not all, but most, they realize that they're too heavy, they're too weighted towards the fix and tune and maybe the grow, and they're not enough invested in or not allocating enough time into building the explore side of the business. Those of you familiar with the literature would of course recognize this as being uh, built on the principles of the ambidextrous organization, where you have your old core business, and then you have your explore new business. So this is just a, a different tool and different setup based on some fairly uh, well-recognized theory. All right, we have just about two or three minutes uh, left. I'm gonna very briefly take you into something that I think is, is important and we're gonna see more of, and that's custom design strategy tools. So we have been doing custom design for different companies over the last couple of years. We've done custom designs for Record Ben Keyser and Fast Moving Goods, Fast Moving Consumer Good. We've done uh, custom design strategy tools for um, Magic, that's the Malaysian Global Innovation and Creativity Center based in Kuala Lumpur in Southeast Asia. And we've done uh, minor custom uh, tools for Statel and Statel's strategy team. Custom design strategy tools matter. I can't show you too much detail on this, but this is a senior working group for Reckon Min Kieser working on their uniquely custom design strategy tool. So how do we do this? 
Well, we, we spent a lot of time on this. And there's three things that matter when we design. And you guys can, can of course, design in different ways. But when we design custom strategy tools, number one, we need strategic insight. We need to make sure that we understand the context. We need to make sure that we understand the current strategy, maybe the emerging strategy. Uh, we need to understand strategic dilemmas, complex issues, questions. And once we have this level of understanding, we have to simplify. Simplify, simplify, simplify. Because we're not trying to provide answers. We're trying to provide frameworks that allows answers to emerge. It's a very different thing. So we try to design from first principle in making these frameworks strategically relevant, but easy to understand. And then we, we design and we test. We iterate and we test. We go back and forth with, with test cases on the client side to make sure that the tools that we have can have the strategic impact that they need. We've seen this work and I firmly believe that in, in the years to come, custom design strategy tools will be much more uh, prevalent than what we've seen in the last 10 years. So that's something I'm very happy to be discussing with any of you uh, afterwards. So how, how do you use them? Go in for the closing of this webinar before we do the Q&A. How do you use strategy tools? Well, first of all, you guys, you can go online, you can download, you can play around, you can test, you'll find a lot of content. But you can use the strategy tools by yourself. You, strategy tool on your laptop, on your iPad, on a piece of paper, and you can sit down and think and reflect, discuss by yourself. You can use it with your existing team, so your regular day-to-day -day, uh, uh, team in your current organization. Um, each of our tools take about between three minutes and maybe maximum 15 minutes of introduction explanation. That is just a matter of getting to work. You can use it in a large kind of cross-functional groups where you have people from business development, R&D, you have people from sales and marketing coming around in mixed groups. And you can use it in very large uh, venues, very large settings where people would normally be sitting for days, which is you know a waste of everyone's time and energy. And you can use it for uh, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of voices of inputs into the strategy process. As some of you know, we are also working on our software development. It's a work in progress. It has been for a while. It's going to be for a while. But we, we're also moving towards a software use of these tools. That's for later on. So let me do just very brief concluding notes. We, we believe deeply that the field of strategy is shifting from the traditional regular strategy as analysis to the more emergent, more dynamic strategy as innovation. Uh, we, for years, uh, we're not the only ones saying this, think that there's a lot of good thinking in the books, but we need to take those books and convert them into tools that are easy to understand, not just academic models, two by twos or four by fours, but really applicable tools that anyone can use. And finally, and this is what we've seen in, in hundreds of, uh, of cases, is by getting the right people around the table or getting the right people up working on the walls, you can really create better strategies, better understanding and better buy-in. I think that's important to us and hopefully it might also be important to to you. That's a good place to stop for now. I have, um, I have one question here. I'm also I'm very happy to take any kind of questions in our Q&A. Um, I, I will suggest or at least invite you to sign up for our next webinar. Uh, our next um, webinar is going to be very, very de detailed going into the three levels of, of business models. And uh, I think that you'll find that quite different from today, but that's on April 19th and 8 o'clock Central European time. But let me, uh, let me take any questions. So there's one question here from Subi Singh that I didn't um, get a chance to mention. So Subi uh, Singh asked about the um, 
market opportunity canvas where we have the uh, IDs from our own organization. We have a new technology and new trends and of course customer needs. <clears throat> so uh, Subi asked about what about competitive view and insights and patents for insights gathering. No, that's, that's, that's good. Um, so competitor analysis, competitor uh, espionage or observation, um, and patents are of course two sources. Um, that is, is worth taking into, into consideration. They kind of emerge in, in our experience out of, um, out of our own ideas. Uh, but it's, uh, it's, it's a good point that the, uh, especially the, the competitor uh, view can be a good source of market opportunity uh, understanding. So it's a good point to, to bring up. Then we have a question from, um, John Beaton here. What success have you had with anal <laughs> analytical people, accountants and lawyers and stuff? Well, it depends uh, how you define success. Um, John, if you would like to expand on your question, I'll, I'll probably be able to give you a better answer. Um, we do have uh, consultants as clients. We do have um, a lot of engineers as clients. We do a lot of work with oil and gas and energy. Um, and my experience is they, they come around. Some of them come around quickly. Some of them come around eventually. Some of them come around uh, difficulty. But generally, with, with the right framing, the right storytelling, um, we, uh, we don't separate between the creative people and the analytical people. Uh, to us, that might have been an issue in the beginning, first two years. Uh, but as we developed our tools and our case, uh, our stories and methodologies, I think we've been able to find a language that, that suits equally well with, with creative people and analytical people. Um, companies that are successfully using our tool um, range from oil and gas engineers, uh, R&D scientists, biotech engineers, uh, top level financial management consultants, um, and of course, designers, CEOs, CFOs. Personally, I really enjoy the positive challenge of getting CFOs to understand our tools. They are understandably focused on current and existing cash flows and current numbers, uh, but in our work and, and using our tools, we, we have had some really, really good impact with CFOs and, and that strategic side of the CFO. So that was a, uh, that was a long uh, answer, John, but I hope that was, uh, that was relevant. Then we have a question from Joseph uh, again. Any thoughts on an ecosystem approach um, where Amazon threatens the existing model? Okay, well, that's the way I understand your question, Joseph, is twofold. So we, we spend a lot of time on ecosystem innovation, system level innovation. Um, some of my, uh, my friends and clients recently wrote a book called The Disruptive Ecosystem. Uh, I'm teaching it in a program coming up pretty soon. Um, so ecosystem innovation or ecosystem level innovation is, is really uh, interesting, important. Fascinating enough, uh, the Verna Alley um, value network analysis fits extremely well to the ecosystem innovation approach. So that's the first part of your question. The second part is, is uh, threatens existing model. Uh, well, I'm not sure if I understand it fully, um, but if you are, let's say you're a retailer, let's say you are a bank, then of course you need to understand that a company like Amazon or maybe Amazon specifically uh, will come after your business. To quote Jeff Bezos, your margins are my invitations. Um, probably the tool that we would use in that case is um, either the strategic innovation canvas or um, three levels of business models, which we'll go through next time. Um, the, so Joseph, you also have one more question or comment here, really, um, where 
ecosystem innovation is not really a growth category. That is absolutely true. Uh, it's more of an explore category, but that's not a, a perfect match either. So what you're looking for is really uh, a way of, of mapping and understanding the ecosystem level versus a, a specific uh, tool that we've been covering so far. Um, any other questions? I would also be very happy to hear any quick comments, observations, reflections. Um, I know we covered quite a bit of content quite quickly in this webinar versus going in depth for just one or maybe two of the tools. And I'd be curious to hear uh, how that worked out for you guys tuning in. Um, our work is far from done. We are actively sharing, experimenting, and testing, uh, running training programs, trying out new models, and listening very closely to our customers and our users to how they use uh, either our tools or similar, similar tools. So if you decide to try one or maybe even all of our tools, we'd be very happy to stay in touch, hear uh, your observations or uh, what worked and what didn't, and how we can tune it and adapt it for higher impact. We, we believe that the tools that we're creating can have a really good business impact in line with how the world of strategy is moving. And if this is applicable uh, to your role or your job, I'd be very happy to hear more about it. Okay, we have a quick comment here from John. Uh, great explanation of tools and background. Thank you, John. Thanks for tuning in. And we're going to close out in about 60 seconds. Um, if any of you would like to stay on uh, afterwards for a Q&A that you don't want to, um, you don't want to uh, share openly, we'll be happy to take that. All right, we have one uh, last or possibly last question from Emil Basile. Where do you see the balance scorecard in tools? Now, the balance scorecard, the score, the balance scorecard is, is of course a framework that we, we know uh, well. Um, Balanced Scorecard is a strategy execution tool. And used for strategy execution, it can be extremely uh, important and efficient. And for a lot of complex organizations, it's almost irresponsible to do strategy without having a Balanced Scorecard implementation framework or software. And we also do some work with the KPMG Incorporator which is, of course, one of, our, one of the balance scorecard software companies. Uh, so going back to 2004, we've, we've seen the, uh, the importance of this. Um, we don't really bring the balance scorecard into our toolkit uh, as is, but frequently, especially if you work with the strategy intro or the innovation portfolio uh, of the strategic innovation canvas, uh, you're going to want to connect scorecard software to it eventually. Then we have a quick comment here for, uh, uh, from Zubi Singh, discussing strategies at corporate levels and then breaking it down between different areas like sales, marketing, operation, any thoughts on how to bring it together? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> we, this is kind of maybe naively, but we believe in co-developing, co-designing and co-learning. Um, so if you have different corporate levels, if you have different uh, corporate functions like sales and marketing, R&D and operation, we really deeply suggest and believe in bring them together, put them in the same room, give them the same understanding, the same experience. It might be done in two hours. Uh, realistically, it might take <clears throat> days. But the strategy insight and the strategy process and the strategy impact it's going to be so much stronger by doing the co-design and co-development. So that's my uh, quick comment there, Subi. Then we have a uh, comment from uh, Abdul. I agree on, uh, on uh, the uh, open approach. Good to hear. Finally, from uh, Sharira Sharifi. Thanks for the presentation. All right, I think I have one more um, one more uh, comment here. Uh, I'm going to make sure to answer that comment, but for most of you, I'm going to say thank you for tuning in for this, uh, this webinar. And I'm very much looking forward to seeing you or connecting with you either for our upcoming webinar on three levels of business models 
or in any channel or in any venue where we might get a chance to, uh, to meet. If you have any questions that haven't gone, um, gone answered yet, I'll be very happy to answer that by email or any other medium. So thank you all and have a good afternoon.